You're listening to episode number 168 of the Keto Diet Podcast, and today we're chatting all about how to differentiate between a binge and a cheat meal, common binge triggers, how keto influences binging, and so much more. If you have questions about today's content or you want to submit a question that I will answer in an upcoming episode, head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. You can also catch up on previous podcast episodes and notes from today's show show by going to ketodietpodcast.com. Just look for episode 168 on that page and you can get all the links and resources that I'm sharing in today's episode. I got a couple cool things to share with you. And the first off is if you already have a copy of my newest paperback book, Keto for Women, and you're snapping pictures of it, maybe you have a selfie of it on your phone, go ahead and post that on social media with the hashtag Keto for Women. And not only will you be entered in to win a $1,000 Amazon gift card. Now this is open to people all over, no matter where you are, I will make sure that you get your gift card. But Every single share that uses hashtag keto for women, I'm donating 25 cents to upwithwomen.org to a maximum of $1,000. Up With Women is dedicated to helping recently homeless and at-risk women to rebuild their lives. The cycle of homelessness and poverty can be extraordinarily difficult to escape. Up With Women gives the skills and opportunities to break that cycle. So when I asked you guys who you wanted to donate to and how you wanted to set this up, so many of you said that you wanted to focus on women, homelessness, giving women another chance to rebuild their lives, and that's why I chose Up With Women. Now, the show is not sponsored by Up With Women. They don't even know that I'm doing this. I just thought it'd be a really fun way that we can give back to the community and also share the message of a ketogenic diet. Last and certainly not least, over the last couple of months, I've been doing virtual book events where I read from my three different books, I answer your guys' questions. If you want to watch some of those episodes, I've saved them all on YouTube. I will include a link at ketodietpodcast.com. Just look for episode 168 and you can watch all those videos. There are a bunch on there. Okay, today's episode is actually a previous episode, episode 84 of the podcast. I cannot even believe, it feels like yesterday that this episode went live. Time flies when you're having fun. And I wanted to bring it back because I've had a ton of questions about binge-like behaviors recently, and our guest Kelly did such a great job in explaining her experience and how to work through these feelings. Now, if you're triggered by conversations about binging and addictions to food and such, I would just skip today's episode and I'll see you back here in a couple of days. Otherwise, if you're listening and you're like, oh my gosh, this sounds so great, I want to make a change in my life, I highly recommend checking out healthfulpursuit.com slash whole, that's W-H-O-L-E, which is my 28-day challenge that works through a lot of the emotions that we have as we try to heal our relationship with food and our bodies. So again, that's healthfulpursuit.com slash whole, and let's cut over to today's interview. Okay, let's do this thing. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women so you can burn fat, balance your hormones, and heal your body. Starting and maintaining keto can be challenging without the right support. So just for listening to the podcast, I want to give you 20% off the keto beginning with the coupon code Keto Podcast. That's all one word. This 30-day program gives you a clear step-by-step how-to so you can quickly adapt to a ketogenic diet, avoid common struggles, and get the results you crave. Go to healthfulpursuit.com slash begin to get your keto beginning discount today. If you're new around these parts, I'm Leanne Vogel. You may know me as the international best-selling author of The Keto Diet, founder of HappyKetoBody.com, or maybe you know me as the nutritionist that likes dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo. I'm so glad you're here with me today. Thanks so much for listening. Hey, Kelly, what's up? Hi, not much. How are you? I'm so good. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so, so, so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. And for listeners that may not be familiar with you, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about you? 
Sure. So my name is Kelly Foster, like you've already said. Um, I'm 26 years old. I live in Toronto. I am a chemical engineer by education, and I'm currently working in nuclear consulting. Um, I lost 100 pounds following a keto diet, and I've been maintaining that for about one and a half years now. Um, and I've been sharing my journey on Instagram, and it started out being all about keto. And over time, I transitioned into making YouTube videos as well. And as my journey sort of progressed, I think what I've really, you know, started to embody um, as my journey progressed is is really just focusing on spreading positivity and self-love and empowering other people. So as I've progressed in my journey, I think that that's been evident in my social media as well. I love it. And what does keto mean to you? I'm guessing that it means something different now than it did before. Absolutely. Something that I that I say quite often actually is is about finding your keto. Um, I think that everyone ketos a little bit differently. You know, there's a lot of different things like macro tracking, and uh, some people eat dairy, some people don't, some people eat um, a little bit higher carb. Um, to me, keto is low carb, high fat, tracking macros, and really just. Uh, it, it's hard to, to pin it down because it's so many things, but it's, it's really just something that changed my life. Mm, yeah, me too. Me too. And so today's episode is all about binging. So let's chat a little bit about your history with binging, if you're cool with it, and kind of how it all came about and the struggles that you had in that space. Definitely. Um, so I think the the first thing to say is that I've sort of had two binging. I sort of have two binging stories and one was pre keto and one was actually very recent. So post keto. So um, I think I'll start off with the pre keto and essentially just a, a very long story short. Um, I was overweight for basically my entire life. You know, went on my first diet when I was, I think, 12 years old. I tried out Weight Watchers and I tried every popular diet that there is out there. Um, and I, I sort of hit a, a, a big um, turning point after my first semester of university where I had just completely let myself go. And I, I got up to 240 pounds and I just something clicked in my brain that I needed to change something. And I decided to go on a diet and I didn't know much about dieting at that point. So I ended up going on a very low carb low fat, low calorie diet where I was calorie counting. I was, you know, I had read somewhere that eating 1200 calories a day was what women were supposed to do to lose weight. I didn't consider that I'm five foot 10 and was, you know, 240 pounds at that point. So I was exercising a lot and I think I was probably netting somewhere around seven to 800 calories a day. And I did that for a while. I lost a lot of weight. I think I lost, you know, 70 pounds in, in probably three months because I was essentially starving myself and it, it kept progressing and, and people were telling me I looked great. So I kept going with what I was doing. And I think because I was eating so low carb and so low fat, uh, it reached a point where my body couldn't handle that anymore. Um, and I started to incorporate cheat days because I'd also read on, on weight loss forums that those were a typical thing that people did. Um, so I started having these cheat days and they started off pretty innocently as a, you know, a cheat meal, go out to dinner and have a burger and fries or something like that. And as time progressed, uh, the cheat meals started to become more frequent they, and they would become cheat days rather than just a, a, a cheat meal. And, and not only did they become more frequent, but I think when they really started to become binges when, was when they started to become a secret. So I think what happened was I was living with my boyfriend at the time in university and the times where I would be deciding to have these cheats was when he wasn't there. So I started having all of these binges and, and at some point I, I sort of started to recognize that that's what was happening, but I really denied it for a long time. And I, I guess I reached this turning point where I started to have thoughts about purging and there is a history of bulimia in my family. So it was something that I was very familiar with and really not a path I wanted to go down, but I couldn't stop the binging. And, and as my binges progressed and became more frequent, that voice in my head that was telling me to purge after was starting to become louder and louder and harder to ignore. So I think the, the last straw for me was one day after a very, very bad binge, um, I found myself uh, over my toilet with a toothbrush in my hand that I was intending to use to make myself throw up. And all of a sudden, I just snapped out of it and just thought, like, I can't do this. This is too far. Um, this It was really just a turning point for me. And after that, I, I went and I, I seeked out professional help. 
So I joined an eating disorder program at my school, um, got treatment there. They really encouraged intuitive eating. And I graduated from the program. I had stopped binging. But what I found after that was that I couldn't find a way to balance the intuitive eating with not putting on weight. So I ended up in this really terrible period for about three years where I was very unhappy with myself because I was putting back on all the weight that I had lost. But every time I I tried to diet again, my binging tendencies were coming back. And that wasn't something that I was willing to go back to. So I I actually ended up quite hopeless and I I gave up and I gained back all the weight that I lost. Um, And then again, a few years later, I decided it was time for a change. And because I didn't have success with dieting, I decided to join a CrossFit gym. And it was at that CrossFit gym that keto was introduced to me. Back to today's episode in a sec. ButcherBox features 100% grass-fed and finished heritage-bred pork and organic free-range chicken. ButcherBox sends you high-quality, health-promoting meats directly to your door on dry ice and free shipping anywhere in the lower 48. ButcherBox makes committing to quality protein sources less expensive and more available to everyone. Their prices are hard to beat, and it's challenging to find a higher quality product anywhere in the USA. I've been using ButcherBox for years and love the convenience of a package showing up just when I need it, and their ground sausage is an absolute dream. ButcherBox has put together a super special deal for all listeners of the show. Order your first box and get a special gift plus an additional $20 off. Now, this special gift is so epic that I can't even mention it on the episode today. So you'll have to go to butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get your $20 off your very first order. Again, that's butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get $20 off your first order. If you're unsure of the link, simply check out today's show notes for all the details. Okay, back to today's episode. And that was amazing. And and for for two years during keto, I did not binge. And I, I really thought that keto had been the cure to my problem. And I still think it is. But like I mentioned, there was a second sort of binging story that happened. And this was at the end of last year. So I I just graduated university last year and I moved to Toronto to start my new job in consulting, Um, whole new, whole new world, whole new life, Um, very different from school, very stressful environment, Um, a lot of work travel and things like that. And I remember one night just, I don't, I, it's hard to sort of explain what triggered it, but it was a very stressful time and I, and I had a binge and it really scared me because it had been two years since this had happened before. And I just thought, okay, it was just a one-time thing. It's, you know, it's, it's not going to happen again. And then it happened again, I think about a month later, and then it kept happening and I was denying it. And just, I kept telling myself that I, I wasn't going back to, to, you know, disordered binge eating where it was happening very frequently. But, um, towards the end of last year, November and December, it started happening every weekend. And at the end of of December, it was actually on New Year's Eve, I had my last binge. I have not binge since. Um, So, I mean, there's really been, like I said, two binge stories. And and that's that got really long. But I tried to give my best um, condensed version of how the two of them have gone. Hmm. Yeah. And I think with the different aspects, it sounds like they were. Do you feel like they were triggered from the same thing or different things? Or have you put any thought to like why it could have happened back in December and and, and what what was going on at that point? Yeah. So I think they they were completely different. I think the first time, um, the, the more long term one where I was on a highly, highly restrictive diet, I think that one was was because of that, because I was eating very low fat, very low carb, not properly nourishing my body. And I think that that's where that came from. And then this one recently at the end of last year, um, I think it was a combination of the the high stress and the, the changes in my life that were going on. And in addition to that, they tended to happen on nights when I was drinking, not solely, but for the most part. Um, I also went through some some tough times in my personal life. And I think that that partnered with alcohol and stress was absolutely the triggers for me. And how do you now like, so it's been since the new year and you're feeling pretty good. Are there things that you do on a daily basis to incorporate a more healthful outlook or are there any practices that you have to help yourself through this? Yep. 
So the way that I decided to sort of tackle this after the new year, I knew that I just needed after New Year's Eve, I knew I needed something to to help me because it had really just reached a point that I was very afraid of of the path that I was heading down um, because I, I didn't mention, but on New Year's Eve, I did have very strong um, urges to, to purge after. I didn't do it, um, but it was very strong. So I knew I really needed something. So what I decided was that I was going to start a calendar where every single day where I did not binge, I was going to give myself a special green sticker, just like a little kid who gets a sticker. Um, I would get one too. And this has been beyond helpful for me. Something so simple has really, really helped me. Um, also in January, I decided to cut out alcohol for the whole entire month. And I think that was important. Um, that gave me time to sort of uh, process and work through the emotional hardships that I was going through. I think that was that was very helpful as well. Um, and just really on a on a daily basis, I think just embracing the belief in myself that I will not binge. I think that I've reached a place where I'm just very strong mentally, and I have more faith in myself to have the power to overcome those urges. And on top of that, the longer that I go without binging, the easier it becomes to not binge because the urges are much less frequent. And I'm able to tell myself, well, you haven't binged for, you know, now it's been almost three full months that I haven't. So it's easier to tell myself that I don't need to now. And I love, I love the calendar. In fact, when I was finally in a place where I wanted to stop having bulimia and I was ready to be done with all of the eating disorder BS, it was that calendar and have I did the exact same thing. I had a calendar and on days where I was winning, I got a smiley face. Yeah. And on days where I didn't win, I got a cross. Yeah. Like just like an X through it. And it was really nice to like visualize that when I was in that positive space. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I love how you said when you chose to, you know, when you decided to end your bulimia, because I think that another thing is sometimes we just aren't ready to, to be done with it. And I think that a big part of me was using alcohol and the emotional stress that I was under as sort of, um, a crutch to allow myself to continue doing that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think you're totally right. Do you feel like do you feel like your binges are tied to, or your previous binges or just those binge tendencies were tied to certain circumstances in your life or emotions that you were trying to unpack? Have you delved a little bit deeper into the meaning of the binge for yourself? Definitely. And that was why cutting out alcohol was really important. And I used that alcohol free month to really reflect on what was hurting me so that I could move past those things. Yeah, I think any of that substance stuff, I'm the same way. I just, that's why I don't do a lot of the things that I used to when it comes to like alcohol and, oh, uh, working out and just all those obsessive behaviors that make it so much worse. Are there now, depending on the type of binger, sometimes people are triggered by certain foods. Sometimes people are triggered by certain emotions. Did you find that certain foods triggered you or continue to trigger you or is food less of the conversation? Food is absolutely not a part of, of the conversation for me anymore. Um, there's, there's nothing that I eat that makes me feel like I need to just keep eating. Um, I think it really is just fully emotional now. And I think that goes to show how different my binging tendencies were, you know, pre-keto and post-keto, because I still do truly believe that keto has freed me from being a binge eater. Why do you think that is? I just want to pick your brain. Do you have any thoughts about like why that would be like any thoughts? I've tried to think about it. And I, I think the best reason is because, you know, like I, I mentioned a couple times before I was eating so low carb, so low fat, which is just a very unsatisfying way of eating. And then when you start keto and all of a sudden you get to bring in all these delicious fatty foods that are extremely satisfying, my body does not feel restricted and I don't feel restricted or that I'm not enjoying what I'm eating. I think that's the most important thing. I enjoy the food I'm eating and I'm satisfied, so I don't feel the urge to binge. Yes, amen. I totally feel the same way if I think back to my binge foods many, many years ago when I wasn't eating keto before I did keto. 
a lot of the binge foods were fatty foods, like ice cream and just like frosting and just like fatty things. And looking back, it's like now that I eat all the fat, it's just not a requirement. But same with you. I had a very different binge experience when I was keto and I still had bulimia as I started a ketogenic diet and trying to navigate through that. But then it became all about carbohydrates. But I think I think you're onto something with that restriction. Now that I don't feel restricted, why would I need to binge? I think that's part of the conversation. And then the other part, which we chatted about was, you know, for you, it was a tendency toward alcohol and that affecting uh, your ability to understand the binge and be able to not control yourself. But I think when there's a substance in there working, it's, you know, situation, it becomes a lot harder to connect to ourselves. And for me, it was, you know, when I was keto, it was all about, well, I'm restricting carbohydrates, therefore, I want the carbohydrates. And when that was all said and done, and I had figured out that balance, then it became, I don't really know how to deal with emotion. Yep. Like, how do I, okay, so if I've had a really rough day, or somebody said something hurtful to me, and I didn't really process it properly, my go to was food. And I planned an entire binge around this entire situation of like, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it in secret. And my husband won't know. And I'll do all this stuff. And it's it always tied back to me being nervous about something or somebody saying something hurtful to me or being afraid of doing something. I know that when I was preparing for the book tour, oh my gosh, I had to do so much self care because those eating disorder fear thoughts, things were popping up like crazy of like, you can't do this. Your book sucks. How dare you think that you have any right to publish a book called the keto diet? Are you kidding me? Like, who are you? You (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. But you know, behind that, it's like, if you struggle with binging, and I'm sure you can relate, it's like, I don't think there will ever be a moment in my life where I'm not just conscious of like, okay, how am I feeling about this? What is the conversation going on in my head? And how do I switch that instead of turning to a binge? Do you, do you feel the same way? Totally. Back to today's episode in a sec. If you're not familiar with Paleo Valley, they make one of my most favorite healthful keto snacks, 100% grass-fed beef sticks and 100% pasture-raised turkey sticks, and they are also fermented. Each stick contains 1 billion CFUs of probiotics to benefit the health of your gut and strengthen your immune system. Their gut-friendly sticks are gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, GMO-free, free free chemical additive, and dye-free, as well as being preservative-free. Many of the flavors are 100% free from carbohydrates and the best part they're really really tasty now you can shop all things paleo valley load up your cart and apply a 20 percent discount code to everything in your cart to take advantage of this offer go to paleovalley.com slash keto fill up your cart and enter the coupon code keto 20 that's keto 20 at checkout to apply a 20 percent off discount on your entire purchase if you're unsure of the link simply check out today's show notes for all the details. Okay, back to today's episode. That's, I think, an, an important part of this, this journey for me was realizing there is no cure for an eating disorder. You're never going to be completely freed from it, but you learn how to live with it and how to control it and how to, how to you know, just keep it at bay, essentially. And and I think that in some ways that could be seen as almost a little bit defeatist. But I think to look at it from the other side, it really just shows strength in being able to overcome that and, and accept that it's something that you're going to battle for the rest of your life. But knowing that you have the capability and the strength to keep it at bay. I love that shift. And something I like to look at it as is my superpower. So some people just like eat and they don't really care. And they don't really think about like how their food and emotions and emotions and food. But because I have to be so hyper focused on that, I think it's a superpower because like not many people can do that or have time to do it, but I need to make time. Therefore, superpower. (laughs) I'm going to start calling mine that too. That's awesome. Yeah. And really like making it this experience, I think, I don't know, did you ever go to like inpatient care or anything to get support uh, with your experience? 
So when I, I never went to inpatient care, but I was in the eating disorder program at my university, which was extremely helpful. Um, it was a free program for any student who needed help. And it was um, every week I would meet with a dietitian, a nurse, a psychiatrist, and then we had weekly meetings. Uh, where we would all sit down and eat dinner together. And then afterwards, we would talk about how the meal went and how our week was and how we were feeling. So it really was just a great. Wow. Support. Yeah, that's amazing. Can, how, what kind of program was this? And where can people find out more? Are you okay with sharing that information? Because that sounds great. Of course. So this, so I attended McGill University in Montreal. Um, I don't think that this is a, a standard thing at all universities, although I think it should absolutely be. So that was at McGill. Um, and that's, that's really, I'm not sure what they offer at other universities, but that's, that's what there was there. I can tell you that that was not my experience. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, think, I don't think that's the standard. Yeah. And it, it should, but it should be right. Like that's something that we should be pushing for because this isn't, an issue that that should be swept under the rug and particularly in in universities and, and colleges, you know, the, the high stress environment, I think, makes eating disorders very prevalent in that in that environment. Completely. I totally agree with you. That's, you know, high school was probably the worst that my binging ever was. And, and there's just so much pressure and your peers and just competition and it's like this breeding ground for those those feelings and those patterns and for women listening now that are like well I don't have an eating disorder how could I possibly relate to it because we've been chatting about eating disorder support and stuff for a little bit I just I really want to reiterate the fact that when there are a group of people talking about eating disorders or one person ex explaining their experience with an eating disorder <laughs> Eating disorder, yeah, for sure. You're diagnosed with an eating disorder, whether it be anorexia, orthorexia, bulimia, etc. You can have disorder tendencies, even though you may not have been diagnosed with an eating disorder, quote unquote. So I think it's really important, um, you know, as a binging conversation, even if you feel like, yeah, well, I just have a, you know, quote unquote, cheat day every Saturday where, like you said, I love, Kelly, that you mentioned like a binge uh, where a cheat day turns into a binge is when it's a secret thing. And I totally, totally agree with you. Like, if you are being secretive about it, then you're feeling shameful about it, which means that there's beliefs that you are not processing properly and think that what you're doing should be shameful. And there's a whole experience around that. And if you were to go to a doctor at a normal weight, unfortunately, even telling them that you're dealing with this, they'd be like, well, like your BMI is blah, blah. And therefore you don't have an eating disorder. Like for real, this happens. I and so although... To, sorry, uh, I went to a doctor to get a referral for the eating disorder program. And his advice to me w when I was leaving, and I don't know if it was just a slip of his tongue or, or if he was just, I don't want to say stupid because he was a doctor, so he's not stupid, but he made a very silly comment where he said to me, yeah, you know, so just uh, stop binging, okay? <laughs> if, if it was that easy, I wouldn't be coming to you to get a, a referral to an eating disorder program. Yeah, it's so true. And there's so many great doctors out there that are trying so hard to make the change that we want to see in the world. And it's just so frustrating when those bad apples just like cause experiences like that, because then the last thing you want to do is seek care because the last time you sought care, you got, you got pissed on <laughs> like, yeah, and it sucks. Yeah. And so I, I Sorry, I um I was just gonna say I really I really appreciate the fact that you use the word shameful um, when you're talking about those feelings because that's the same word that I always use when I'm trying to describe the feelings that you feel post binge or even sometimes during the binge. I find that when I'm binging, I tend to almost sort of black out. It's like an out of body experience where I'm just I'm just completely blocking out any emotions and thoughts you know, shoveling food into my body as quickly as I can before I can even process what I'm doing really. And then the shame and the guilt that follow when you, when you finally, you know, when, when those walls break down and you're not blacked out anymore and, and the, the shame and the guilt that really just will consume you if you, if you let them that's really the best way to describe what it, what it feels like. Um, I don't think I have ever felt emotionally worse in my life than the way that I felt after some particularly bad binges.
I hope you're totally digging this episode. I love putting these together every week and I hope you're getting something out of it. I love seeing where you're listening from. So next time you're listening or even right now, take a picture of yourself watching the show or a screenshot of your favorite episode and tag me on Instagram at healthful pursuit. And if social isn't your thing, that's totally fine. Just jump on your favorite podcast player and leave a review for the show. Okay, back to the good stuff. Wow. And it's so interesting, the different binge experience, and you don't have to be diagnosed with an eating disorder to feel that way. Because my thing and the problem that I had in overcoming it was that I had no, no shame of the experience. I was like, yeah, that happened. It was awesome. Oh, I would do it again. That's so oh, yeah. No shame, no regret. No, I didn't care. And I think that comes from a different place of me just not even caring about my body, the effect I was having on it didn't even care. And so, you know, it, we can all experience a different, a different way to get, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the same thing, but it's a completely different experience from two very different people. And it's just so interesting to me. And I think the conversation about binging it's unfortunate because like you said, that doctor experience that you had, maybe women and men too would be going to their doctor saying like, I need help. And because they don't look a certain way or because they don't have a certain experience that they're told like, oh, just don't worry about it. Or I mean, I've even heard clients of like their doctor saying, well, I mean, you could lose some weight. It's like, huh? Like these are disordered tendencies. And I think the major thing, the major huge thing that made a shift in my perspective was finally being kind to my body and showing myself um, love and just being kind to not only how I was feeding myself, but how I was caring for my body. And um, for me, because I didn't really care if I binged or not, whatever, um, there was clearly a lot of work that needed to be done as opposed to you who was like shameful. Like, why did I do that? It's so horrible. Yeah, but I think I think also um, my shame came from a place of um, self-hatred as well, because um, it was, you know, my thoughts were, and in both stages of the binge where, um, you know, you've eaten all of this food, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna, you know, derail all of the progress that you've done on getting health and, you know, using words like fat, which isn't a word that I like to use at all, but, you know, telling myself that I was going to gain back all the weight that I had lost and, and things like that. So the, the shame was very much centered around, um, not loving myself and not loving my body. And that's also been a huge, huge part of my journey really in the last, I think, six months has six months to, to maybe nine months has, has really been my key focus on, on learning how to love myself because I lost 100 pounds and I still didn't love myself until I started making the conscious effort to do so. Yeah, that conscious effort is such a huge piece. Do you find like, have there been instances where you're on the verge, you know, probably what I'm talking about, like right on that ledge of like, am I going to binge? Am I not? Like, it's just, just teetering. How do you get yourself off that cliff? Are there any tools? Definitely. So I think that, um, the biggest thing for me, and because we talk about shame and secret, if I'm at the stage where I'm telling myself that I am not going to do this, the first thing that I'll do is tell someone, whether that's going on my Instagram story and, and being open about it there, um, texting or calling one of my close friends or family members. Because when I, when I remove the secret of it, and that really makes it so that I will not do it. Because if it's not a secret, then it's just, it's not an option to me anymore. Um, I guess it's like the same thing I wouldn't binge in front of someone. So even if someone knows that I've been contemplating it, it really takes it away from me. Um, and then the second thing is just to, to if, if I'm not there ready to tell someone, quite often what I'll do, and this might sound silly to someone who hasn't done it, but I will go and look at myself in the mirror and speak positively to myself about my progress in terms of binging. So for example, now I'll go look at myself in the mirror and say, you haven't binged for, you know, however many days but I keep a, a log. Um, and I remind myself that, you know, you've done so well, so you don't want to, you don't want to break that now. And not only that, but there will be food tomorrow. I re always remind myself that there will be food tomorrow. It's not the last chance to eat. Um, and I remind myself that the urge will pass. So those are sort of the, the you know, the go-tos for me. Telling someone, 
speaking positively to myself, looking in the mirror, and then just reminding myself that the urge will pass and I can eat again tomorrow. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big takeaway and something that I learned too. Like the food will always be there. I remember having so much anxiety about like food going away, like just disappearing. Did you have that as well? Always. And and I don't know where that came from. I'm like, literally, if I, if I, it's like if I'm at a restaurant and they give me too much food, it, it's like, it's real. even now I still struggle with this. Like, and it's not a binge, but just overeating in general. Um, you know, they, they give me a, a huge steak and I'm like, I feel like I have to eat it all right now. You know, and I don't understand why I am that way because I could take it home and eat it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. I have to remind myself constantly as like, just get a doggy bag, put it in the fridge, eat it tomorrow. Like it will still be there. It's almost like we have, um, we have three dogs and one of our dogs is a rescue that had a really rough life. Like Lexi has seen it all. And when we got her, she was so protective of her food and like everyone and just was like so aggressive to everyone, everything, every dog, everything. And um, we rescued her because nobody wanted her and she was going to get put down that same day. And we're like, we'll figure it out. And it took her, uh, well, we've had her for 11 years and she's finally okay with me, like going toward her and touching her food and like, you know, petting her and being like, it's okay. And we take our time and she eats. But before it was like, do not touch my food. I will bite your face. And that's how I feel. It's like the Lexi urge of like, don't touch my food. It is mine. And I don't, I haven't worked on that to figure out, like unpack that. But that's what a lot of people say with binging is like this feeling of like the food running out. So it might be helpful if you've experienced, I've experienced it, maybe somebody else listening to just repeat to yourself, like, it'll be there tomorrow. Like, there's plenty of food and this is a major first world problem that we can just say, don't worry, just go into the fridge tomorrow. Lots of food. But I found that to be really helpful in overcoming that binge feeling of just like, don't worry, it'll be there tomorrow. Now you've been very honest with your relationship with food uh, and your body on social media. Have you found that that's been helpful or hurtful to your overall experience? I think that that has been one of the most positive things about my experience. Um, I think something really interesting is that when you say things out loud to someone, even if that's just social media, um, it makes them more true. It makes it more real and it makes it more true. Um, and I think that when I say them out loud and especially to other people, it forces me to confront my issues rather than denying that they exist. Because, for example, when you keep a binge a secret, you feel the shame, but that's it. And I think that that's, you know, that also goes along with telling someone when I feel the urge to binge. But I think that the, the biggest part that helps me and the reason why I will never stop sharing is the positive reinforcement that I've been getting from the community. First of all, um, I've, I've gone on my, my Instagram story post binge really just at my absolute lowest, like actually in tears. Um, in the, in the height of that guilt and shame that I would feel post binge and received hundreds upon hundreds of messages of love and support. And that is just second to none um, in terms of how, how helpful and how great that was. But I think the second thing that, and that will make it so I will never stop sharing is that I get messages from, from people after this telling me that I've helped them recognize that they have a problem as well. Um, or that me being open about it has encouraged them to do the same. And I think that's, that's huge, you know, to be able to help someone else recognize that maybe they they might not have an eating disorder, but they might have eating disordered behavior, like you mentioned, um, or they know they have a problem and now they finally feel the the strength to tell someone. That's really a, the you know some of the first steps in addressing a problem that they have, and to be able to facilitate someone starting out that journey of recovery is something absolutely invaluable to me. I think it's really brave what you're doing. Like if you look at general social media right now, it's like the happiest pictures of people living their life, happy, happy. And there's you being like, oh my I'm gosh. Not, my I'm like ugly crying into my, into my Instagram story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it's that realism and it, it takes a lot of guts to do what you're doing. Um, I've only ever made a video once at my lowest being like, oh my gosh, this happens. And I think it's, you know, it's so important to show people that you're an actual human so that they can also relate to you. Like, I think it's quite terrifying when you follow people that are like 
so happy all the time and nothing bad ever happens. And you're like, how? Like, it's just not possible. And we all deal with struggles. And I think it's really important for us to continue on that conversation. It also helps you connect with people. Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. You're a human. I'm a human. We should be friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't even speak to how many people I've developed true you know, relationships and and friendships with from social media. It's incredible. I feel like I have so many best friends that I haven't even met in real life. That's amazing. That's so cool. Okay. So I have two final questions for you. The first being, what do you feel is missing in the keto space for women? I love that you asked this because it really ties into what you were just saying, which I think is the openness to share with each other. And I think that this is something that we can all keep working towards because, you know, like you mentioned, it's, it's in social media, it is quite common. And, and I would say that even in the keto community, I don't think it's any worse than any other community, but it just exists. This, I guess this, need to appear perfect because in all honesty I I do see some people in the keto community admitting when they've had an off day or gone off track and things like that but I think that because not a lot of people are doing that not a lot of people feel the the courage or the ability to do the same and I think that if we can really foster an environment where everyone is you know comfortable talking about when they're not perfect It'll also just allow us to love ourselves more because we can accept that it's okay to not be perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that perfect is not a thing. I totally agree with you. And where can people find you? Like what's your Instagram handle? Yep. So I'm on Instagram. It's at Kelly underscore keto and I'm a special snowflake and my name is spelled K E L L I E. Try to find any personalized objects in a gift card when your name is spelled that way. And by gift card, I mean gift shop. (laughs) Yeah. Same with me. Leanne was just like not a thing. And my sister's name is Christina and she always got all the personalized things. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also on YouTube. My YouTube channel is just my name, Kelly Foster. I love it. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Kelly. I really appreciate it. And thanks for sharing such a raw topic with all of us. Thank you. I'm honestly so happy to talk about it. Yeah, that's so great. Well, the show notes and full transcript for today's episode can be found at healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash E84. And thanks again for just sharing your life with all of us, Kelly. Really appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.